All right, welcome. This is, uh, in this lecture, we're gonna be looking at chapter 13, adults with psychosocial development. So that age range about 25 to 65, give or take. Um, but the social side of things, right? So we looked at the biology a little bit more, the, the kind of physiological changes that are occurring in this in this period of life. Um, today we're looking at kind of how we, how we navigate our world, finding our place in it and things like that. Um, our environmental factors that, that play into it. So as always, chapter 13, you can find on, not as always, this one is chapter 13, you can find on, on page 461. Um, the as always part is don't forget to do the quizzes, right? Listen for the four random facts as we go. Um, and don't forget to do the quiz for the lecture as well as for the chapter. You can find both those in D2L. Um, and let's see, anything else? Four random facts, quizzes. Check in D2L. Okay, PowerPoint is in D2L if you want to follow along with that. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, it could be interesting. Um, today is one of those like my brain is like woo, so we'll see how this we'll see how this goes. Um, so yeah, here we go. <coughs> let's just let's get going. Slide two: uh, Personality development in adulthood, part one. Erickson stages. Um, so Erickson, there's actually going to be, nowadays, about four stages that are going to be uh, involved in adulthood, two of which specifically are in the age that we're looking at, um, the one being the uh, identity versus uh, role confusion that, that basically was adolescence now trickling into adulthood, and the the last one being integrity versus despair, which is the, the as we enter into our senior years, um, that's basically the, the stage when we begin to uh, kind of look back at our lives and see how we've how we've been. You can see some descriptions of them on page 463 if you want a little bit deeper uh, explanation of those. Um, but let's go ahead and roll with this one. So Erickson stages originally he envisioned eight stages of development which occur in sequence from birth through old age. And to some extent they were age based, right? First year of life was stage one. Couple next couple years after that is stage two. Next few years after that is stage three. So on and so forth. Um, three of the stages cover the years after adolescence, but again, adolescence is kind of trickling into adulthood nowadays. Um, adult stages are less age-based, so it's not going to be like, well, at this age you're going to start it, and then by this age, if you you know if you haven't accomplished it, it's going to be a problem. Um, that's not so much how these ones work. Okay, um, so you could be 20 and experience. Uh, intimacy versus isolation, which is his his uh, the first stage in adulthood, essentially, where we we have discovered ourselves and we are now looking for someone or something to basically give ourselves to, kind of get ourselves out of our our self absorbed tendencies. Um, generally, that's going to be a someone, right, a, a partner that will go with us for life. Um, generativity versus stagnation might fall, might happen by your thirties. Might happen in your 40s, might happen in your 50s, right? Like that, it, it really it does differ from individual to individual when the, that kicks in. Um, oftentimes, it's connected to when our kids be, start to get older, to where they can begin to kind of you can start passing on your knowledge and things to them. Um, and so nowadays, oftentimes you won't you, you'll you'll notice some, some kicking in like late 30s, early 40s, uh, with the generativity side of things, where you're, you're kind of Wanting to leave something behind is the is the beginning portion of this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the idea there. And then the final stage, integrity, generally happens in your older years, but it can happen. Like I've seen some people that have probably actually been begun the process, um, you know, in their in their fifties even, uh, where you're kind of looking back and going, "Have I lived a good life?" Um, and if the answer is yes, you feel like you know more. You've had more good than bad, kind of a thing. You, you have this sense of integrity of of self. Um, it's almost a re, a re exploration of who am I, uh, that we might've been kind of dealing with in adolescence, right? Um, have we, has there been a, a strong tendency? Have I built, been grown in virtue and things like that? Um, and if so, I have a sense of peace and of, of serenity that comes with it. And if not, I can fall into despair potentially. So later in his life, Erickson stressed that stages and ages do not occur in lockstep. It's not going to be, uh, you know, just this. Just the, this is how it is, and once you do it, you're good to go. Or if you didn't do it, too bad, you know, kind of a thing. Um, it th there is some adjustability within his stages. Okay. Slide three. So 
Here's the stages. Identity versus role confusion. I guess I should have just bumped forward before I started talking about them. Um, <clears throat> so again, that's going to be the adolescence trickling into adulthood. Um, looking at those four pillars, right? Sexual gender, vocational work, uh, religious or spiritual side of things, and political ethnic uh, kind of aspects of who am I. Once we find out who we are, kind of how we fit in the world, um, we move into this intimacy versus isolation. I've discovered myself. I, I, this, the, the intimacy versus isolation is where I begin to get out of my own head, essentially um, seeking out intimacy, looking for close uh, reciprocal connections with people. Okay. Um, and again, that's generally going to be a romantic partner, although it could be something like a vocation, um, to, like if you become a, you know, a hermit or a monk or nun or something like that, um, or join some kind of a cause in, in some way, shape or form. But it's, it's some way that we basically, it allows us to find our, our, our give ourselves to something, um, and, and get that sense of intimacy from it. Not necessarily sexual intimacy, but oftentimes that is part of it. Okay. Um, and it's a lifelong continuation, right? We are continually renewing this. Once we've discovered intimacy, it's not like, hey, I got it and I'm done. Um, it's a process, right? Um, looking at, you know, like me and my wife, uh, we've been together for several, several years now. Um, but the, uh, it's, it's a day to day. It takes work, right? Any good friendship you even have, it takes work day to day. Uh, if you want it to be a, continue to be a strong relationship and friendship, um, you have to keep building on it. It's a lifelong process. It's not just like once and done kind of a thing. Um, uh, one thing that they have found is that isolation. Even if you even if you have found intimacy, okay, you found someone that you've been connected with. Um, if something happens and it breaks up, you can shift from intimacy into isolation. Okay, so you, you, you found someone to give yourself to and all this, but, you know, a few years down the line or whatever, it just doesn't work. Uh, you get divorced. Um, there's a death, right? Um, it, it, is, it basically throws a kink into the established feeling of intimacy. Uh, that disruption can essentially make you feel this sense of ice, a stronger sense of isolation. Interestingly, this is even in, a, in later adulthood. They found, um, so married people typically actually are happier than non-married people until their spouse dies, which at some point, one of you is going to do that. And possibly both of you at the same time, which that would be probably like ideal in my mind. Like my goal was to live to be like 110 and then we both just kick the bucket at the same time. But um, if, that, if that doesn't happen, what they found is that basically the, the, there is an increased happiness uh, for married people until the spouse dies, at which point the, the, there's a drop in happiness that where they end up being below that of people who weren't married to begin with. And then if they live long enough, it kind of balances out where they're about the same as the, as the person uh, who was never married. But it's a bit of a roller coaster there until you kind of come to that settled state. And that can take several years um, in many cases to come back up from that. So it's kind of a, it's a balancing act a little bit, right? Um, but yeah, it's not just like a once and done Early, earlier side of things, like if you got through the first year of life, generally speaking, you know, you're, you're going to have a pretty strong sense of trust if it went well. Uh, it's, it's, it's not quite a set in stone in this stage. Uh, the generativity versus stagnation is that caring for the next generation, either raising your own children, um, mentoring, teaching, all those kinds of things, right? Like all those, those things where you're kind of helping others and passing on uh, your legacy to, to the next generation coming up. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be like what you'll see a lot of times. And this is part of the reason why uh, this, this age from 26 to, to 60 is the most productive um, of, of all the different stages of life. It's that we, we, we kind of are, we've discovered ourselves. We have all these skills that we've built in our earlier points of life. Um, we start to produce and then we start to look for a way to basically, you know, basically build a society up looking at the future generations. Um, and then integrity versus despair. Uh, when Erickson actually reached his 70s, so, so there's a, when we, when we look at the, the later adulthood, um, one of the videos I'm gonna recommend you watch is a, a video of uh, interview with Erickson and his wife, Joan. Um, and they, they kind of talk about, they were in the, I believe Erickson was in his 90s at the, end of the time of the video and Joan was in her 80s. Um, 
but they talk about like kind of after after having ex gone through life, um, gone through all these stages, kind of looking back, what do they think and, and things like that. And it's really an interesting. It's interesting to hear, hear the two of them uh, who worked so closely together for so many years uh, express their their opinions on this. But, um, but yeah, basically, it, it's that time to kind of to, to reflect and and see have I done well, and if not. Right. If I maybe my I've wasted my life, it's a time where potentially you could fall into despair because of that. Okay. So we'll look at that more in depth um, in the next lectures. So, all right. Slide four: Personality development in adulthood. Maslow stages of adulthood. So Maslow. Um, Maslow's an interesting guy. So Maslow was a a, a uh, Jewish American. Um, he they they he grew up in New York. Uh, in, in the city of New York, and he grew up kind of watching people. This was back in the 19-teens, 1920s, when he was uh, kind of observing people. And he started to take note that there were essentially uh, people who seemed to not be pursuing the things that actually truly made them happy. They would kind of get plateaued at certain levels or certain things, and they get stuck there and not really move beyond it. Um, and that intrigued him. So he started studying people and sociology and psychology and all this. Um, and he, he came up with the idea uh, that there are five stages, essentially, of it's, it's, it's Maslow's pyramid of, of, of uh, or hierarchy of needs. And it looks like a pyramid generally, like kind of like a Aztec pyramid. Um, but movement occurs when people have satisfied their needs at one level and are ready for the next steps. So we're going to look at that in just a second. So in his later years, Maslow uh, reassessed his final level self-actualization, suggesting another level after that called self-transcendence. Um, we'll look at that in a second, but here, if you go to the next slide, slide five, you can also find the same image on page 464, um, but it's basically just his little, his, his hierarchy. Okay. Um, so the most basic level are, is your physiological needs. Uh, and there actually has been some research, some of it terrible, that has been done to, to that has proven that this is in fact true. Basically, if your basic needs aren't being met, that's all you can focus on. Okay. Um, Nazi Germany was actually one that they did experiments on where they found this, which is again pretty terrible. They took people who were starving in their concentration camps, um, they, and one of them they did they took the men's uh, camp. The men were starving. They, they starved them additionally for uh, a number of days. They brought them into a small theater uh, and they had a woman who was stripped naked and they had a plate of food put before them. And uh, pretty all the men basically didn't even notice the woman. They were so hyper-focused on the food because the food is the basic need. And so this is kind of where you get that, like those, those, that rule of the rule of threes, right? Uh, you, you can last, you can survive three minutes without air. Right, you might be super hungry, but if somebody suddenly like plugs your face and plugs your nose and you can't breathe, being hungry isn't going to matter to you anymore because if you can't breathe, you're going to die. And so that that takes up all of your attention at that moment, right? So so, breath, getting air, um, shelter, three hours without shelter. This is the rule of survival, three, the rule of threes in survival. Um, if you get too cold or if you get too hot, you're going to die. Basically, is what, the, what the idea here is, and so. You need, you know, if it's cold, you need fire uh, and, and something. If it's rainy, you need to get out of the water so you don't get hypothermic. Um, if it's way too hot, you need to find shade and water to drink, hopefully. But that's kind of a separate part. Um, otherwise, you might become uh, uh, hy hyperthermic, too hot, basically, fevery and end up dying. Um, heat stroke type stuff. But you need shelter. Okay. So if you're freezing cold, assuming you can breathe, the fact that you're freezing cold is going to be the thing that kind of overwhelms your mind. Um, you can last three days without water if you get too thirsty, like food and stuff kind of ceases the matter. Uh, you can last approximately three weeks without food. And then there's a, a, a last one, which is actually, um, they, you can last about three months without love. But we're going to look at that in a second here. Um, so yeah, right. Food, drink, shelter, that's your stuff. Uh, once those needs are met, we're looking, it allows us to move to stage two, which is safe and secure. Um, this is being protected, being defended. This is also where you, you know where your next meal is coming from, right? You have a sense of, of security and like you, you have a home to live in. You have food that you can put on the table. 
Um, there's stability, right? So it's it's more than just like you know I feel like no one's going to like attack me. It 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 actually it goes beyond that to just that sense of 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 that all of all the things that you need to survive are readily available to you. So it could be connected to having a job, um, where we have a, a constant income to where you can make you know pay your bills and things like that. Um, that's going to be that safe and secure side of things, right? So it is physical security, right? It might involve physical protection or things like that, but it also has to do with just that, that sense of stability um, in our life. So once you have that met, you feel like, you know, you know where your, where your food is, you got, you got a refrigerator full of food, a house that's relatively consistent, you got an income, you know, paycheck that's coming in. Um, then we move up and you don't have to worry about people coming and like taking your stuff, right? Then you move up into stage three, which is love and belonging. So being loved and appreciated as a partner, family member, and part of a group. Um, we want to basically have people to love and to be loved by. Okay. Um, if we don't achieve this, interestingly, uh, it actually will, statistically, it will shorten your life. Uh, in many cases, actually, even more so than like smoking cigarettes and things like that. So... Uh, it's important, right? We need, we need to have at least one person that we can love and be loved by. And being loved back is, is, is just as important as loving someone else, right? I could love a whole bunch of people, but if they don't love me back, I don't really get the benefits from it. Um, and so, so having a potential romantic partner or extended family or, you know, like a, a friendship group <coughs> that, we, that we connect with, um, that's important. Once we feel like we have achieved that, we got friends, we got family, we got a loved one, whatever any one or combination of those things, um, it allows us to then move up to the next step, which is esteem, being respected, successful, and admired. Um, so I got friendships. They all like me, right? I like them back. Uh, then, then, But I want to start to be basically a, a higher member of the community. Okay. Um, so this would be moving up into leadership positions or things like that, where people begin to recognize not just me as a friend, but like maybe I'm starting to recognize at work and things like that where, where they, they recognize my skills and my abilities and I'm able to have this sense of higher esteem uh, in the eyes of those around me, right? My accomplishments are recognized for, the, for how good they are. Um, and with that, people have respect for me and my, my you know, actions and all those kinds of things. Um, once you have that, it allows you to move up into self-actualization, which is becoming your unique and wonderful self. It's kind of that where you truly are able to ask those deeper questions of like, who am I? Uh, you know, what's my purpose in life? Where do I belong? All those kinds of deeper questions. What's my, you know, you know, what can I do to, to maybe improve the world or things like that? Um, am I going to leave a legacy behind? Those deeper questions on that level. Now, toward the end of Aslo's life, he also suggested there's a sixth level. And this is where we essentially transcend our self and start looking at the greater good of mankind. Um, this would be like your Mother Teresa's, your Martin Luther King Jr.'s, um, your, let's see, too, some other, I'm trying to think of other people. There's not as many people nowadays, it seems like, as you had like back in the 80s and 90s, but, and 60s and stuff, but um, like Gandhi and, and like all these like people that are, they're, they're, they sacrifice their own good. For the greater good, right? Um, yeah, that, that's basically the idea is sixth stage. Um, and which can actually, the higher you go on these, it can actually affect how you view the lower stages. Um, so if you notice, the, the first two stages on the, on the pyramid are based on just basically physical needs being met. The, the third and fourth levels are based on your social status. And then the fifth level, that final level, and possibly sixth level, right, is, is really connected to kind of our, our deeper understanding of self and our purpose in life. Um, now, he, he, it wasn't, it's, this isn't like Erickson where once you've accomplished something, you just move to the next stage automatically. Because um, in some cases, you might be working on, like, let's say I'm working on building esteem, and then something happens and, like, you know, a war breaks out or something. And suddenly my physiological needs come straight to the forefront, right? All of a sudden, I'm not sure if I'm going to get food um, or maybe I am starving, right? Or something like that. Suddenly that becomes the thing and I drop down to the bottom. So this isn't, it's not just like, a, oh, I'm just progressing along and here I go. This can be an up and down 
kind of a deal. I could even be up in self-actualization and then suddenly get plummeted down to the bottom. Um, or get plummeted down to maybe love and belonging. Maybe I have, you know, my, my a loved one dies and it kind of spins me out where I'm like, I don't have someone to love or be loved by. And so I, I come back down into that stage of trying to find that. Um, but yes, but, but once you get to those higher levels, oftentimes it can adjust again how you see things, right? You can have people who like, might, might starve themselves intentionally. Um, so they, they forego the physiological needs being met for the greater good. Um, it, it, you know, whether or not that's effective, who knows. But, the, the, but that idea of kind of, it, it adjusts how you might see things. You know, I, I, I think I mentioned before, I, I lived in a monastery for a while, um, kind of exploring that possible route. And I met men in there that were, um, that went, like basically let go of a lot of those lower level things, right? They, uh, their basic needs were met. They were eating enough to live on, um, drinking enough water and things like that. They had shelter. Um, <clears throat> and there was a sense of security with that, but it was very simple, very plain. There, it was just the most basic side of that. Uh, love and belonging was was really connected to the the brotherhood within the monastery, um, and and but they didn't even spend that much time together, right? It was a limited amount of time. They spent much more time uh, in contemplation and things like that. Um, esteem essentially kind of to some extent went out the window. Um, from what I observed, most of them really didn't care what other people thought of them. It was really their focus was on themselves and 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 uh, and essentially kind of their relationship. To God and things like that. Um, so, and I would say that they were they were much more on the self actualization and in the uh, self transcendence side of things and how they were approaching life. So, um, yeah. So those you know choices right we make can allow us to uh, adjust how we view these things. Maslow felt like what most men were getting stuck in or most people were getting stuck in is essentially stage two through four. And not moving forward with 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 uh, two and four specifically being kind of the main ones, right? This is uh, four when things go wrong. He felt like is essentially where, you, or even actually two when things go wrong. This is where you have a guy who has you know fifty million dollars in the bank, and he's still striving for more because he doesn't have enough yet. He he would say that this person is either struggling in stage two, maybe he just for something happened in his past where he couldn't feel secure, and even with all that excess. Um, or possibly stage four, where he was striving for esteem to a point that actually potentially was unhealthy. Um, because it didn't allow you to move and progress further in life, right? It's kind of like you, you jammed the gear basically and it didn't let you change gears into the next gear up. Um, so yeah. Uh, it, it's a it's an adjustable thing. It, it really is going to be shifting. But it, if you once, if you're aware of this and you're, you're realizing kind of what the goals are, once your needs are met, it allows you to move forward. Um, if you see it as if you perceive it as your needs being met, right? One person might have nothing but rice and beans, and one person's like, I'm not. My physiological needs are not being met. Another person is quite content with that, right? So that the the perception also is going to have a big effect on kind of how you view it and if it allows you to move forward in these stages. Okay. Stage six, uh, personality traits, the big five, part one. Um, so this is kind of an interesting one. Um, there's actually a whole class on personalities if you want to, like, if you ever wanted to really dig into this. It's kind of a fun thing to look at. Um, but they've been looking at, at different factors in, in, uh, in personalities and things like that. And these, as far as science goes, there's, there's a whole ton of, of personality tests out there. Um, some of the more famous or popular ones are like the Myers-Briggs. Uh, there's the 16 personalities, which I think is the most popular current test out there. Um, it's it's kind of a, that one's actually kind of a crisscross of the big five as well as the Myers-Briggs. Uh, but they, with, scientifically speaking, they, they found that the big five seem to be the most uh, biologically based. These are gonna be the things that are relatively stable in most people's lives, right? It can adjust. It's it's a, it is a sliding scale, um, but generally it's gonna there's gonna be a relatively consistent stability in most of these areas. 
So longitudinal, cross-sectional, and multicultural research has identified five clusters. This works no matter where you are on the planet. These are five things that you can find basically uh, people are going to be having in, in some level or other. Okay. Uh, they appear in every culture and era. <laughs> so you have openness. So openness is going to be like your tendency towards imaginativeness, curious, artistic, uh, creative, open to new experiences, and all that kind of stuff, right? Just that, that tendency to like experience as much as you possibly can. People who are more open are, are looking for, uh, are, are, are willing to explore new ideas and all those kinds of things more, more readily. Okay. Um, and it really is kind of that, that creativity and things like that. You can also find these on page 466. They have the little like run down there. Um, consciousness or conscientiousness is, uh, going to be how organized you are, how deliberate you are, uh, if you conform to what's expected of you, right? Um, how self-disciplined you are. And again, it's a sliding scale. And you might have, you might be really strong in parts of this and then not so strong in other parts of it, or you might be just like really strong in the whole thing. And that's like, you know, your thing. Um, so yeah, conscientiousness, for example, like myself, not exactly the most organized person in the world. I wish I was. ADHD though, thwarts that. Um, but I am relatively self-disciplined, so I have a strong level of that. I don't conform very well, right? All those kind of things. But so you can kind of, so you can see that. And that's where like the 16 personality tests and things like that can help um, kind of with understanding that. Extraversion, uh, extraversion is going to be how going, assertive, and active you are. Um, <clears throat> so if you are like a person who, you know, you fill the room when you walk in, not like necessarily literally, but, you know, with your, your personality and things like that, um, that's going to be your extroversion scale. You, you could be outgoing, though, uh, while at the same time being kind of non-assertive, you know, versus, or you could be very assertive, but not very friendly, outgoing. Um, you know, also those are going to be, again, that sliding scale factor there. Uh, agreeableness, how kind, helpful, easygoing, or generous, and or generous you are. Um, so, yeah, those, those first four are going to be positive attributes. We Generally speaking, <clears throat> at least in the United States, for sure, but likely worldwide, um, there's some difference in some cultures. But anyway, uh, they found that if you score high in the first four, you're, you are likely to have higher success overall in life, at least in the United States and the Western Europe kind of things, like Canada and things like that. Um, the fifth one, neuroticism, if you score low, you're likely to have a better quality of life overall. So neuroticism is connected to being anxious, moody, uh, the tendency towards self-punishing and overly critical of self and things like that. Um, so we want to score high on open, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness, and low on neuroticism uh, to basically have the best potential life. If you take the 16 personalities, maybe I'll find it, I'll, I'll find a link to it and throw it on there on the discussion or something or on the something. I'll find something for you to look at that. Um, Anyway, it might already be up there. Who knows? Take a look. Look around. It might be on the announcements. It might be in the content. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll decide once I once I get it built. Uh, uh, but anyway, it, it, it's built off of basically, it, it uses Meyer Briggs terminology. So it's going to be introvert, extrovert, right? And that's, gonna, that's basically just the sliding scale of extroversion. Um, <clears throat> it's going to have intuitive versus sensing. Um, I have to look at the site again to really pull it down. But anyway, you can you can kind of explore that and see where you might land on that. And then the final piece, and that's what so they have they have they have either if I can remember the different letters, it's E versus I, S versus N, F for feeling versus T for thinking, and J for judging versus P for perceiving. And then on the 16 personalities, they have a third one or fifth one, which is um oh shoot, I can't remember. Turbulent versus something, I think. Um, but that basically is the neuroticism levels. Okay. So that way you can kind of figure out how it lands. So there's also actually big five tests you can look at taking too. Um, I just mentioned the 16 ones because it's it's the most popular out there. So okay, seven. <clears throat> so personality traits, the big five, part two, actions and attitudes linked to the big five. Uh, education is oftentimes connected to conscientious people, they're more likely to complete college, right? If you're well organized and, and have that tendency of, of following through and things like that, uh, it, it increases your likelihood of making it through college and things like that. 
Um, cheating on exams is going to be connected to low agreeableness, right? You're not really worried about the other people. You're, you're looking at, like, if I can get away with this kind of a thing. Um, marriage, often extroverts are, are more likely to get married than non-extroverts. Not a guarantee. You could be a super introvert and still get married, but you're just more likely to seek that out as if you're an extrovert. Um, divorce is more likely for people who are high on the neurotic scale. Um, high IQ is connected to higher levels of openness, uh, oftentimes. Verbal fluency, openness and extroversion are going to be are going to be tied to that, right? We want to openness allows us to explore ideas. Extroversion allows us to want to engage and, and share with those ideas. Um, political views, conservatives are typically less open. Not always, though. Um, but it, it lends itself to less open thinking versus the liberal thinking that lends itself to more open thinking. Um, so yeah, that's basically what they found. Again, if you have high levels of those, of those first four out of the five and low levels of neuroticism, um, that's generally, people are generally the happiest in life with that. Okay. Let's see, slide eight. Personality traits, age and cohort, age. Personality generally undergoes a slight positive shift with age. We become uh, more open. We become more uh, uh, conscientious, right? With, with experience and all these kinds of things. Uh, our agreeableness usually improves with age. Not always, but usually. Um, and our neuroticism usually goes down. But it... Again, it, it, right, if, if you have a tendency toward being very open, let's say, you might become even more open with, with, with time. Um, if you're not very open, you become a little bit more open, right? Or you might even become significantly more open, but it's still not going to be as much as the person who has a natural tendency towards openness, um, generally. Uh, so people move from changing environment to fit self to changing the self to fit environment. So we begin to typically, again, I think I mentioned this when we looked at the, the emerging adulthood, um, if you look at like a rally or something, most of the people you're going to see there are going to be that 18 to 25 year old group, right? Um, you're going to see less and less older people. They're still going to be there, but there's going to be less of them percentages wise um, as things go. And that's partially reflective of this, where we, we begin to, instead of like, we're going to change the world, it's I'm going to change myself as much as I can to be the best person I possibly can to basically make the world a little bit better through my personal actions, right? Uh, cohort will affect personality and behavior interaction. So example, number of children and families, 1920 versus 1960, right? 1920, average household size was like five or six kids. 1960s, it was down to like two point something. Today, it's down to 1.8, I think was the last I saw, which is kind of creepy. And we're below the replacement rate, essentially, at this point, um, unless you include the uh, immigrants. But... Um, those, those changes in, 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 in family dynamics and things like that also will affect the development of these personality traits in an individual. Okay. Uh, you'll find this slide, so slide nine, you'll find this image also on page 466. Um, do individual personality traits originate in the brain? What they found is that most of them do. Okay. So these, these parts that are actually lit up in red and orange are, are different aspects of the, of the brain that are connected to our, our, like the more developed they are, the higher a given level will be. There's going to be more activity occurring in those areas um, for, the, for different areas. Um, specifically for conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, openness doesn't actually have an area of the brain specifically, but we can measure the other four. Um, openness seems to be a little bit more connected to training um, rather than a, a biological uh, aspect. But again, that's that's still we're still researching this. This still actually is, is is a relatively it's the idea of personality traits and things have been around since like the 1930s or 1940s. Um, <clears throat> but it, it as far as really studying it scientifically, it's still a relatively new um, field. So okay. Uh, let's see. In, in this image, the, 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 let's see, two sides view. So the left and the top and bottom view, right of brains of people high in neuroticism. Um, and so these are the, the areas of the brain that are connected to neuroticism. The brain regions known to be especially sensitive to stress, depression, threat, and punishment are those yellow bullseyes in there. Um, we're more active than in the same brain regions of people low in neuroticism. So 
There you go. Okay. Slide 10. Intimacy connecting with others. So intimacy varies by culture, age, and personality, right? Each person is going to have a different need for intimacy. One thing that it remains consistent for every single person on the planet is that we need intimacy. How much of it we need differs. Okay, so intimacy needs are lifelong. Um, adults meet their needs for social connection through their relationships with relatives, friends, coworkers, and romantic partners. Um, basically, any of these or all of these are, are ways that we can get those basic needs met, right? Our, the, the, the intimacy needs are really connected to that friendship. It's someone to love and be loved by, right? Um, and so that could be, you know, I've, I've had coworkers in the past who I, I really did have intimate relationships with. Um, you know, we, we, we were good friends and had deep conversations together and things like that. Uh, I've got friends from that we've been friends since middle school. Um, I actually have one, one friend that we are still friends today, and we've been friends since third grade. Uh, we had a little rough spot in high school. We got back together afterwards, and we're, you know, we're still, we still get to talk all the time on the phone and things like that. Uh, so, so it, right, that, that, I don't know what my point of that was, but anyway, um, any of these things can meet technically your intimacy needs. Romantic partners are useful also because they also help you meet your sexual needs typically, um, assuming it's a good, healthy relationship. Um, but yeah, it could, it could be any uh, mixing of these things can meet your basic needs. Every person on the planet basically needs at least one person to be intimate with, to have that friendship and that deep connection with. Um, Sadly, what they've been finding is that research has shown that our, our, our friendships and things fade with time oftentimes. And so by middle age, especially for men, men tend to, tend to typically actually be kind of uh, shallow on their intimacy needs being met. Um, and so that's a that's kind of a worrying thing for a lot of middle-aged men. And it's connected to the, the increase, actually. They believe it's connected. There's at least a correlation um, with increased rates of drug abuse and suicide occurring in middle age uh, for men and women, but more heavily for men um, in this case, because men just don't seem to have the ability or the, the, the circumstances in which they find those connections more or easily. So, all right, 11 <clears throat> percent of U.S. adults who married by birth year. Uh, if you were born before 1940, there was like 98 percent chance that you were married. Uh, born between 1940 and 1960, closer to 90 percent chance. Born between 1970 and 1980, a little bit below 80% chance of getting married. Um, and the, the, the trend seems to be still shrinking. More and more people are choosing not to get married um, rather than choosing to get married. Um, it's still oftentimes desired, but it's not necessarily practiced. So a lot of people in theory are de will desire to get married, but it's not necessarily a guarantee. Um, let me see if this is... You can find this image also on page 468 if you're following the book, just in case. But anyway, um, yeah, most emerging adults today are unmarried. Um, 1980 to 2000, if they if they had included that, rates would be about 50%. Um, of basically, of millennials would have chosen to get married. Um, so the, the, the tendency towards marriage is, is, is dropping, which is also probably reflected in, you know, the, the family sizes shrinking and things like that. Okay. Um, slide 12, other forms of romantic partnership. So you have cohabitation. So instead of getting married, um, you might just live together. Varies in plans and prospects, right? There could be different reasons for it. Is the preference for many people nowadays. Um, is common in emerging adulthood especially, right? I've noticed one of the one of the trends it seems like in, in emerging adulthood is basically we are putting off those those um, long term obligations uh, that people used to embrace earlier in life. So things like marriage, having kids, and things like that. We're putting them off at, at least until later in life, or in some cases, choosing not to not to inc include them at all. Um, <clears throat> so it involves some socioeconomic and gender differences. Um, socioeconomic, there, there's a higher percentage of people that choose to live together or cohabit rather than marry that are in the lower class, like socioeconomic classes. Um, but it, it's becoming more universal, this, this choice, rather than, rather than getting uh, married institutionally. Um, living apart together, or LATs, involve a steady romantic partner. You have separate residence and activities. 
Um, you're sexually faithful to that person. You're not like sleeping around or you know even romantically involved with other people. You are you are connected to that person specifically. Uh, and you sh the one of the big things is the struggle with financial aspects of relationship. If you are in fact keeping two residents and things like that, um, that becomes much more expensive, which is one of the reasons why some a lot of people today are choosing to cohabit rather than um, keep their own residence. Right? It, it, it's cheaper to share an apartment and basically be roommates. Um, who also happen to be romantically involved. Uh, it can cause a little more turmoil if things don't go, like if, if you if you choose to break up uh, and you're sharing living space, basically, that can cause more turmoil in the breakup um, compared to those that are living apart. Because like, you know, if I have my own place and she's got her own place and we break up, you know, the, our relationship has changed, but basically that's all. I still have my own space with all my own things and things like that, so. Um, but yeah, it, there's you know, arguments for both of these areas. Uh, 13, Romantic Partners Part 1. Adults everywhere seek committed sexual partnerships. Um, the, the, the exciting idea of like the one night stand and you know friends with benefits and, and the, the hookup culture and things like this um, has actually been found to be, to be very uh, unsatisfying for most people, right? We, we, we might see like on TV and on, on movies and things, kind of the playboy being glamorized, right? They get the, the person who sleeps around all the time and just gets like, oh yeah, they're partying and all this. Um, but we, they found that that happiness usually drops pretty drastically for people who live lifestyles in that way. Um, it's, it's not what we, it's not where we flourish. Where we flourish is when we generally find somebody who we are committed to um, and, and, and they, we get to really know them and emotionally connect with them. And they get to know us and emotionally connect with us, which actually increases our romantic, uh, the, 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 the satisfaction we get in our romance. Uh, partners help meet their needs for intimacy, as well as to raise children, share resources, and provide care when needed, right? If I get sick, my wife's there to take care of me. If she gets sick, same thing. Um, I can still help take care of the house and all those kinds of things. Um, we both we have each other to help with our kids and all that, right? Married people are a little happier, healthier, and richer than never married ones. But not by much. And again, that 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 number does shift um, if if there is a death or things like that. And if you get divorced, that can also throw a hiccup into the happiness side of things. A happily married couple maybe is a better way to look at it. Um, happily married people are are generally significantly happier, healthier, um, richer varies. But it it you know it it's still slightly more because you generally either have two incomes with one household or um, one income, but you don't have to do like childcare and all that kind of stuff. All right, I for forgot to do the random facts. So here's random fact number one. Uh, humans have been performing dentistry since 7,000 BC. One of the oldest professions in the world is dentistry. There's actually archeological evidence of it happening as, uh, as early as 7,000 years ago. Um, yeah, if you're getting into dentistry or if you're getting into like the, the, the dental uh, hygiene or things like that, you can be proud of the fact that you're getting involved with something that's been around for thousands of years. So kind of cool. Okay. Um, 14 romantic partners, part two, three aspects of love, according to Sternberg. So Sternberg was a researcher. Um, and, and basically what he found is that the, the three aspects are going to be passion, intimacy, and commitment. When you have all three of these things there and, and that are evident, basically love, is, is what occurs, okay? Um, and romant the idea of romantic love. Um, it is also very possible to actually maintain romantic love throughout your lifetime. So a lot of times you hear about like the honeymoon stage, right? Um, and it, to some extent it's true. You got about a year to three years, give or take, that your, your, your brain is basically high on love. Um, there's a lot of additional neurotransmitters and things that are available during that early stage where, where it, it glosses over the, the, your romantic partner's uh, hiccups and things like that along the way, right? All the little, all the little weirdnesses about them. Something that might drive you nuts. Uh, you might have, like let's say you've been together for 10 years and the romance has kind of faded. All of a sudden there's some aspect that they do that drives you nuts, whereas you might've found it cute when you were first together, right? Um, but with a little bit of effort, it is possible to actually maintain a, a, this, a high level of like the romantic feelings toward each other 
that butterflies in the tummy kind of a feeling where we have a high level of passion and intimacy and commitment to each other through that period um, that can go well beyond the, uh, the that that honeymoon stage. And in many cases, if, if you if you do it, if you manage it, it actually increases, it intensifies with time. Um, because not only do you have that that you know excitement from the other person, but you also have this this long history built together where the intimacy side of things and the the um, commitment is deeper than it was when you were first together. So uh, it's it's quite possible to have you know be married for 50, 60 years technically, uh, and and still have deep romantic feelings for each other, which is pretty cool. Okay. Uh, romantic partners part two, three aspects of love according to Sternberg. So commitment is the most crucial and it correlates with lifelong health and happiness. If you feel committed to the person and you know that they're committed to you, um, or at least you perceive that they are committed to you, uh, that's, that's really where we see the health and happiness benefits coming from it, right? It's a healthy relationship, essentially. Um, passage of time, age, ethnicity, personality, education, and circumstances are going to influence love. It's going to influence how it looks, how, it, how you play how you play it out, right? You might've seen those things like the love languages and things like that. Um, so kind of understanding that part of things can help. Um, but you know, you're going to have a natural tendency towards one kind of, of like, this is how I get my love tank filled versus, uh, you know, another thing. So it'd be like one person likes words of affirmation. One person likes touch. One person likes spending quality time together. One person likes gifts and like understanding those things. Um, can really can benefit the overall romantic relationship. Um, couples increasingly link their lives over time. Your identity, and this is this is historically also been a fact. That the identity basically begins to get blurred to some extent. So we we have found ourselves in adolescence. Once we find someone, our intimate connection, <laughs> our we 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 blur that self identity with their identity also. Right, two people becoming one. Uh, is kind of like some of the old terminology, and it, it really does stand to be, to some extent, true psychologically. Okay, I'm st you're still an individual, but at the same time, you you get more and more deeply entangled, basically, in the other individual. Okay. Um, sixteen romantic partners, part three: the empty nest. This is the time period in life, right? 25 to 65, um, when generally if you have kids, emptiness is going to happen. You might be you know, one of those people that has kids when you're in your 50s or 60s, um, but statistically that's relatively rare. So emptiness is the time when parents are alone again after their children have moved out and launched their own lives. Um, contrary to outdated impressions, this time often improves a relationship. So sometimes kids, um, as much as you love them, they are stressful. Right. I don't think anybody, anybody who has kids wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, kids aren't stressful at all. Um, if you are, it's probably you're either on something or you're <laughs> not paying attention to your kid. Oh. Um, but. Um, so, yeah, they're going to be stressful. Right. Um, they also are extremely time consuming. And again, if you say, no, they're not, they're like, you're not you're not doing it right. Uh it, they, they take time. You, you, you need to be spending time with them, teaching them, helping them learn, taking care of them, feeding them, you know, changing diapers when they're little, making sure they are closed, uh, monitoring friends. Like it, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. And because of that, a lot of times romantic partners will find that their romance might kind of be put on pause once they have kids, right? Um, it may deteriorate. It may remain the same. It may improve. But generally, it's going to be a little bit more challenging because you don't have very much time to spend just with each other because you got these kids that you're also spending time with and taking care of and all these kinds of things. Um, what they found is that for most couples with the empty nest, once the kids leave, it's a rediscovery of the romance that you have for each other. You basically get to fall in love again, all over again, with the person that you spent most of your life with, or at least a good chunk of your life with um, at this point. So it, it, you know, it's it's not this bummer thing as much. It might be kind of sad, right? Like I'm, you, you don't really like necessarily look forward to your kids leaving, um, but when they do leave, you shed a tear and you move forward because that's what humans do. We we move forward when with time. We know hopefully if we've done well with the raising that they're going to be uh, thriving young adults and and moving into their their new aspects and views of life. Okay. 
17, uh, other forms of romantic partnerships, uh, gay and lesbian partners. So similarity between gay and lesbian and heterosexual partners is fairly true, fairly solid. Okay. Um, we need, again, we need a, uh, some kind of a connection, intimate connections, and this is one way to get it met. Uh, biggest difference between uh, married and cohabiting partners within this group specifically. There are less people that choose to get married in this group and or less people who are able to get married in this group compared to uh, the heterosexual couples. One, one thing that shows that they actually probably want to get married is that like in New York, when they, when they legalized uh, gay marriage, on July 24th, 2011, 16,046 uh, gay and lesbian couples uh, went and got married. They actually had to like pull out a bunch of judges and stuff to get it, to make it happen. So, <clears throat> so marriage generally is good, right? As long as it's a healthy relationship. So 18, romantic partners, divorce and remarriage. This is what happens when it's not a healthy relationship. All relationships, including divorce, are influenced by the macro system and exosystem. So picture you have yourself and you have those external systems that are looking at like culture and your direct community and things like this. Um, divorce occurs in one third of first marriages in the United States. Odds of divorce increase with subsequent marriages. Um, there are, again, there's going to be some certain personality things, right? Like if you have high levels of neuroticism, it increases your likelihood of getting married or not getting married, of, of getting divorced if you get married. Um, if you get divorced and then you get remarried, that neuroticism is generally still there, right? Uh, which basically means that you're going to be a more challenging person to be with. And so it increases the likelihood of divorce happening again. Um, there's other factors also there, obviously, but that's that's one of the on the individual level, that's one of the big factors. Uh, often women suffer more than men. Men's intimacy needs are at risk. So, so the, 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 the big changes are gonna be like oftentimes the financial need. Uh, a lot of times if, they, if there's kids involved, the, the, the mother ends up with the kids, or at least it has in the majority of the time. So there's more strain on her. Um, she's gonna be essentially living the single mother life, which can be more challenging. Single father life is also very challenging, but the single mother, Again, the odds are she's going to get the kids more often. And so because that, it puts more strain on them. Um, where men tend to kind of flop after a divorce is actually in the intimacy side of things. They, 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 men don't connect as easily as women do oftentimes. And so their intimacy needs oftentimes, uh, they struggle with it. Uh, divorce reduces income, severs friendships, weakens family ties, right? You have... Friends who are who are friends with you as a couple, and all of a sudden you're divorced, and so they have to take sides and all this stuff, and it it makes a lot of mess um, in all these areas, and it can make. Yeah, you know, there are times where like maybe your family actually takes the side of the spouse that you're divorcing, or things like that. Um, it can make things very challenging, plus the stress on kids and all these kinds of factors. So, but in, in there are cases where it is really needed, um, but it. it there are other cases where it could be worked through with some effort on both parties, though. That's the, the, the trick there is both parties have to want it um, to make it work. 19, romantic partners, divorce and remarriage, part two. Consequences. So uh, the consequences can last for decades. It's a lifelong, usually, one from, you know, you're married together, there's a divorce. It's going to at least be an extended period. Where as the, if there's kids involved, as they grow, you're going to still have to be connected to each other. Um, the stresses of it. The financial shifts and things like that can last basically the rest of your life, potentially. Uh, potentially affects children in negative and positive ways. If it was seemingly a good marriage, oftentimes that can involve or affect children very negatively. Um, on the other hand, if there was lots of toxic stuff going on, screaming and yelling and conflict and, and all that kind of stuff, um, in those cases, oftentimes the kids actually will fare better after the divorce than they did before. Uh, it reduces the stress. Basically, once they kind of come back come back down and there's, they can adjust to the, the normal that it is now, um, hopefully they end up with a good parent, right? Uh, but in any case, that oftentimes they'll, they'll, they, can, they can kind of readjust and be much better off. Uh, impact income and family welfare. You, you, now you, you, you know, you've broken home, so now you have two people that have to have two separate places to live generally. Um, you have to have two separate incomes, so maybe time spent with kids is going to be reduced because you don't have that extra person to help out. 
um, all those kinds of factors. Sometimes leads to stronger and warmer parent-child relationships um, because basically maybe maybe once the tension is gone and the stress of the other person, now you can really pour yourself into your kids. And so with that, it can actually build relationships potentially. Not guaranteed, but potentially. Okay. Uh, friends and acquaintances, part one. Everyone is part of a social convoy. These are all those people that basically have semi-grown up with you. Uh, you know, like they're in your same age bracket and things like that, roughly the same period of life that you are dealing with roughly the same things, that's gonna be that social convoy. A uh, group of people who get together and provide protective layer of social relationship throughout relations throughout life. Um, so your family members, your friends, your acquaintances, strangers, all of these kinds of things, everyone that's kind of going through life together, right? Um, so when family bonds are similar to friendship bonds, relatives are mainstays of the social convoy. Um, so friends, if you're lucky, you'll get friends that stick with you for, for life, right? Or at least for a lot of years. <laughs> um, but if you have fr if you have family connections that are actually like more deeply connected, so I have a cousin, for example, who's just slightly older than me, um, and we've basically been, like, we live in separate states now, but... Uh, we've been pretty close to best buds essentially since we were babies. Um, and that, that, that friendship remains strong between the two of us. Every time we get together, it's like no time has passed. You know, we're just back where we were, um, doing, doing stupid things together. But, uh, we are both much more mature and we don't make as stupid of choices as we used to, but we, we still are pretty dumb. But, um, you know, we, but it, it, it's cool. You have that deeper connection. And because that because there's that family tie, even though space and time has gone by, um, we are more likely to can reconnect and get together again. Um, so, yeah, in, in, in some cases, family can actually be better than just friends. Um, but if, if family is lacking, then, then friends easily can, can fill that need of, of intimacy and things like that. Okay. 21, friends and acquaintances, part two. Um, are typically the most crucial members of the social convoy, often are able to provide practical help and useful advice when serious problems, death of a family member, personal illness, loss of a job arise. And that's friendship are typically, friendship is typically the most crucial member of the social convoy. Um, so again, the friendship could be family, but generally it's also going to just be those outside people who you choose uh, to make part of your life. Okay. Random fact number two, Canada eats more mac and cheese than any other nation in the world per capita. They like their mac and cheese. So there you go. Canadians and mac and cheese. Um, <laughs> kind of makes sense. If you live up way up north, mac and cheese has a lot of like carbs and fat, which is basically what you're looking for um, when it's cold. 22, friends and acquaintances, part three. Um, friends over the years, so chosen for, for mutual loyalty and aid, right? We're looking for people that, that we can connect to and uh, be, be deeply connected to, right? Like I, like I said, I have friends from, I have a friend from third grade, I've got friends from high school and middle school um, that we still are connected to. And I would honestly, I would still be willing to call them, but some of them are out of the area, but um, those that are kind of roughly in the area, if something happened, I would call them and ask for help. And I'm, I am assuming that they had any time at all, they would be there to help me. And same thing, if they called me, I would be there for them. Um, they provide practical help and advice when life starts to go a little haywire. Um, you can ask for, for some help or some thoughts. Um, if you if you got a you know a project that needs to get done, they're there to help you out, things like that. Uh, it, the friendships will tend to improve over time, right? Friendship is like a good wine. It, it just improves with age or good whiskey for that matter. Um, aid, physical, and mental health. If you have friends, you are healthier. <laughs> if you have, I mean, statistically speaking, if you have good friends, at least one, if you have at least one good friend, uh, you will be healthier and happier and have a better quality of life than if you have no friends. Um, and it provides encouragement, and you're also going to str struggle with things like anxiety and depression less than you likely would if you didn't have a friend. Uh, provides encouragement in most aspects of life if they're a good friend, right? Um, universally, humans are healthier with social support and sicker when socially isolated. Again, they've actually found the, the likelihood of death at an earlier age um, 
is equivalent to that of a person who smokes two packs of cigarettes a day. So if you have no friends, your 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 body basically suffers from it, right? And your mental your mental state and things like that suffer from it. If you find yourself in a posi position in adulthood and you have no friends, do your best to find some, right? It's going to take effort. Any relationship takes a lot of effort, uh, but it's worth it. It's worth it in the long run. So make sure you you if you have friendships already, make sure you maintain them. Spend you know take that time to to make a phone call or or go out for coffee or something, I don't know, whatever, um, and, you know, go for a walk together or something, find, find that time, make, like, nourish those, those friendships that you have, they really are important for, for your thriving, okay, and for theirs, um, 23, family bonds, part one, uh, family links span generations and endure over time, uh, even more than friendship networks or romantic partnerships, right, Friends come and go, but family is always there kind of a thing. Um, usually, right? Sometimes families are rough, but that's, you know, if, if you have a good, a good again, if you have a good relationship with your family, um, it really is important. Family closeness can sometimes be destructive, right? Uh, it can become controlling. It can become stressful. It can become toxic. Uh, and so in that case, if there is a close family and, and all those things are you're too intertied where you can't be yourself, um, it can become a negative thing. Okay. So it's a balancing act and it's going to look a little different from culture to culture and individual to individual, like as far as the needs and if it's healthy or not healthy and things like that. Um, but yeah, 24 family bonds, part two, parents and their adult children. So relationships between parents and their adult children are more likely to deteriorate if they live together. Um, if you, if you spend a lot of time together, it generally there's going to be some tension that occurs, right? Um, especially as, as adult children are beginning to like try to take on their own things. In some cases, the parents are like, get out. Like they just give me, give me my space. You need to get out and fly on your own. Um, but, but, uh, or in some cases you might be very happy together, but oftentimes statistically the odds are that it, it, it gets rougher. There's, there's tension that can build between the, the parent and the child adult child. Uh, in poorer nations, living together may be more closely related to poverty than affection. So you might not want to live together, even in the United States. A lot of times, you know, I, I'll talk to kids who are in their mid-20s. I say kids, you know, they're young adults. But anyway, um, I talk to people who are in their mid-20s and, and they talk about how they're living with their parents, but they don't want to. Like they, they tried to move out, but then they couldn't afford it. So they had to move back in. And because of that, there's sometimes there's some resentment at the fact that they can't make it on their own. Um, in themselves. And so they, they, they come out of kind of with like a chip on their shoulder and that kind of spoils the relationship to some extent. Um, happiness is strongly affected by adult child well-being. If you have children and your adult children are doing well, you will be happier. If they are struggling, you will be stressed generally. Um, all the research shows that parents provide more financial and emotional support to their adult children than vice versa, right? If you're, if you're, if you're having kids because you see them as like a retirement fund, don't like that's not that's not how it works. Um, generally speaking, especially for the first several years after they leave the house, they, they still need a lot of help kind of figuring things out uh, along the way. You're going to get lots of phone calls to help, you know, emotional support, things like that. Again, if there's a good, healthy relationship. And there's a decent chance that they're going to be coming to you because you're hopefully established um, that they come to you to, to if, if they find themselves in hardships. Um, so, yeah. With uh, one of the things again that with that with that happiness being connected to adult children, what they found, um, if one child, let's say you have five kids, okay, let's say you have three kids. I'm going to use this isn't a personal personal example, but it's a personal example from somebody I know. Let's say you have three kids, and two of them are doing great, okay, but one of them is struggling. They found that that one child struggling that has trouble, you know, things like that. Um, negatively impacts the parental's well be the parents' well-being um, more drastically than the kids who are happy. If all of them are happy, the parents' well-being goes up significantly compared to somebody who doesn't have kids. If even one of them is struggling, though, the, the parents' well-being goes down uh, because of the stress that that basically that they're vicariously experiencing through their child. Okay. Um, any, like again, you know, you have three kids, two of them are doing great, like they might be super successful, but the third one's struggling, 
that struggle is actually going to outweigh the good that comes from the kids that are doing better. Um, so that's that. 25, Family Bonds Part 3, Fictive Kin. That includes people who become accepted as part of the family. This could be like godparents, godmothers, you know, godfathers, and things like that. Not, not in the Italian mafia sense of the thing, but, um, well, maybe. Anyway, but people like, you know, they're, they're, they're just family. They're friends, but they seem like family. I have a friend that, you know, my kids call uncle. Uh, I'm not going to give his name, but anyway. Um, and that's, you know, that's just kind of, to, to them, he is family. Um, so yeah, includes people who become accepted as part of the family who have no genetic or legal relationship to that family. Uh, may become important when blood relatives become toxic. So if you have if you have family and it's not a good relationship uh, on either end, right? Like older older family siblings and or kids, and it's it's unhealthy. Um, sometimes finding finding those those fictive kin, those those people that are not blood family but but like bond family, um, can can be a way of kind of replacing and be allowing you to become basically more resilient in dealing with what life is throwing at you. They can provide a lifeline for adults rejected by their original family. Friends become very important in those cases, especially in the earlier adulthood stages, right? Um, so you broke ties, let's say you have a very toxic family and you break ties. If you have some kind of family friends that you can connect with that are healthy um, mentally and things like that, has a good healthy relationship, that can buffer that, that the negative effect of having that toxic family to begin with. 26, generativity. So again, this is Erickson's uh, seventh stage. Um, the chief form of generativity is establishing and guiding the next generation, right? Um, usually shows itself around middle age, but not a guarantee, okay? Um, every parent is tested and transformed by the dynamic experience of raising children. Again, if, if, if you don't think having kids is stressful, you never had kids. Um, and or you're like not paying attention to them. So uh, an interesting thing is like you, you might be thinking that that you you're, you've mastered this and you're you're like I got I got parenting figured out. Uh, then the kiddo moves to the next stage. You're like, well, crap, right? Uh, or crud or whatever. I don't know. Shoot. Okay. Um, is that there's that tendency to like like as soon as you think you got it figured out, they just they change. And then you, if you have more than one kid. You're like, I got this figured out. And kid number two comes along and they're totally different than kid number one. And then for me, like kid number three comes along and they're totally different than the first two. And um, so yeah, it, it's an ongoing learning process. And that continues right on through and in, into you know having adult children and things like that as well. Um, changes in caregiving are gonna be affecting you. Like we were looking at the different stages, right? Different ages are gonna need different levels of care and things like that. Um, same. On, on the adult end of it, we're adjusting to figuring out where do we need, how much care do they need, how much, how little care do they need, like does my relationship need to be more of like a guide, or am I needing to be like kind of like, you know, pushing them along, or like where where do I need to be for their good as well as for my own good. Um, another aspect of, of uh, generativity sometimes, and a lot of times, especially if you have like a larger family, um, you might experience somebody called what they would refer to as a kin keeper. Okay. Um, this would be like a caregiver or somebody who basically uh, takes responsibility for, for connecting and having that communication open amongst family members. Right. I have an uncle. Um, he was the young. So my dad has five, him and four siblings. So there was five kids in his family. Uh, my, my uncle, who is the youngest of the five, has kind of taken on this role of kin keeper. He's constantly calling with, he calls all of the, all the, all of his siblings. Um, when my grandparents were alive, he also kept them in the loop and everything. But he also calls all the cousins on a fairly regular basis and kind of just keeps everyone connected, asks questions, you know, how you doing? And all that, and just touches base, lets you know how other people in the family are doing. Um, but they kind of take on this role of, of keeping the family tied. Um, stronger than they would be maybe otherwise okay that's like a little side note anyway <clears throat> parenthood part one erickson after the stage of intimacy versus isolation comes generativity versus stagnation when adults seek to be productive in a caring way so adults satisfy their needs to be generative in many ways including creativity caregiving 
and employment, right? You can have kids, and that basically you have built-in, uh, <laughs> you have uh, built-in generativity, right? We have these people that were like trying to help survive until adulthood to to, to allow them to, uh, to to thrive, hopefully. So we're trying to give them all the skills and everything that they're going to need to thrive as adults in our world. Um, but even if you don't have kids, you you can find that that sense of generativity through. Uh, you know, through, through your actions, through, through maybe you, you volunteer and things like that. Um, we're, we're basically just looking for someone to care for, not in a necessarily like a romantic way, but to, to do in order to pass on our skills uh, and, and, and leave that, that sense of um, purpose that can be connected to that. So that's employment, um, creativity kind of things, and all that kind of stuff. It could be maybe art and things like that. All of those could be connected to part of this generativity. Uh, 28, Parenthood Part 2. Raising a child is perhaps the most stressful family life experience. So they've done studies. <clears throat> First five years of, of a child's life, um, there is a, a significant increase in happiness of the parents. From 5 to 18, there's a little bit of a decline, but they've actually, if, if you take out the financial factors, so kids are expensive, right? Little kids are kind of expensive. When you get above age five, they start eating a lot, and they, you know, they need clothes regularly and all those kinds of things. So kids get very expensive, <clears throat> and if uh, they found that that when you include the financial thing, um, there is a, a relatively increased amount of stress on the parents during that period. So from age five to eighteen, approximately, uh, you'll see a, a kind of a spike in stress levels. If you factor out the financial stress though of them. You actually find that there's a, even through even through adolescence, right? Most people are like, "Oh my goodness, adolescence is crazy." But even during adolescence, there is an increase in happiness with people who have kids versus those who don't. If you factor out the financial stress, okay. Um, so in other words, kids make you happy. Your own kids specifically make you happy. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't take away from the fact that there's that they're stressful, right? Uh, intimacy needs can be postponed, right? you and if you're having kids, it's going to be you and your wife or your wife and your, your husband or whatever. But anyway, um, those kids take time away from you. We talked about that a little bit earlier, right? Like with the empty nest syndrome, part of the reason why that can be a good thing is because all of a sudden you don't have that responsibility anymore. Um, so you can actually spend time together again. But in this case, when you have kids, you can't. Uh, adult perspectives may be reordered over time. Um, adjustments are having to be made, like you're, you're shifting the things as, as your kids are growing and trying to figure out where do you fit. And like, this kid is different than this kid and like all of those kinds of things. Right. Um, so with all of that, it leads to stress. It also is happy, but it leads to stress. Okay. Um, 29 parenthood part three, biological parents, children affect their parents through their personalities, needs, and sheer existence. Um, Interesting little random side fact. Uh, they have actually found that uh, having kids, like there's a genetic shift, basically, or a biological shift, not a genetic necessarily, but a biological shift that occurs when you have kids. We talked about it a little bit when like, you know, kids are born, <coughs> uh, hormone levels, even in like the father, shift permanently. Uh, testosterone drops a little bit for the men uh, to make you a little bit better at caring for your kids and things like that. You're a little bit less aggressive and things like that. Um, but on a psychological level, they've actually even found that things like for, for, for men, every daughter that a man has, his life expectancy statistically is increased by six months. Um, so if you had 10 daughters, you could potentially live for five years longer than you would have statistically again. Uh, otherwise, <clears throat> um, for, for, for mothers, sons increase their, like, their life, are likelihood of a longer life by three months. It's a little bit less. Uh, but like, so there, there is going to be, there's a lot of, of shifts that occur when you have uh, children that are yours genetically. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, adoptive parents can also get some of these same benefits. <clears throat> okay, so lifelong legal connection to the child. Um, current adoptions are usually open and reactive attachment disorder may occur. And this is basically where it's like that, you know, you're not my dad or you're not my mom. 
there's a, they, they don't connect very well. Um, but in some cases, adoptive parents can actually have some benefits compared to biological parents. Um, one of the big things is that they're legally connected to the children, just like the biological parents are. Um, but, uh, if you are adopting, if you're choosing to adopt, it's pretty much guaranteed that you really, really wanted that kid, right? You wouldn't, generally speaking, most people wouldn't adopt, and be like, eh, I don't know if I really want a kid. I'm going to adopt one anyway, right? That doesn't happen very often. Um, now that doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? Uh, I have some cousins that adopted a kid that he, he had some, um, he was treated very badly in his first three years of life before they were able to adopt him. And, and he had some struggles throughout his life, made the parenting of him very difficult. Um, but honestly, they, they put up with more than probably most biological parents I knew would. So there's that, that tendency of, of the child wanting, being wanted versus in some cases, biological parents want their children. In other cases, they don't, right? Like that, that can have um, pretty deep psychological effects on them, either positively or negatively, depending on that. Um, with, with adoption, especially if, if the parent adopts an infant, um, there, can, there can be an equally strong bond between the parents, the adopted parents, and the child compared to like biological parents and the child, right? Um, like it, you can you can truly develop a, a a deep deep connection that basically gives you the, the, all the positive advantages of of having your own children uh, biologically, so psychologically speaking. Okay. Um, slide thirty, <clears throat> parenthood part four. Step parents changes are always disruptive and effects are cumulative. Right. It could be the best person in the world, but as soon as you enter, like you you're you're basically kind of stirring the pot of a settled uh, system, right? You have a mom and her kids or a dad and his kids, and then you, you bring one person in or possibly one person and their kids into that mix, and it's going to cause some stress. Even if they're wonderful people, it's going to cause some stress. Uh, positive merging and attachment are not always forthcoming. Sometimes there's resentment connected, especially depending on the circumstances that you're entering in. Maybe they, they, you know, they see you as kind of, a usurper of, of the other parent, right? It's like if you're a stepdad, maybe you're the usurper of their real dad, and you're like, you're not my father, kind of a thing going on, right? Um, which causes tension and stress and makes that transition even more challenging um, compared to like, you know, again, even if they're really welcoming of you, it, you're, you're disrupting the, the flow. So that can be tricky. Um, stepchildren offer unexpected stresses to marriage. They found that uh, having stepchildren involved oftentimes will make a, a, a step when, when two people come married. If one of them or both of them have ch children already, um, it's there's more likely there's a, a higher level of turbulence essentially within the relationship, uh, and higher level of stress, and a higher level or higher much higher chance of uh, conflict occurring because of the added stress of kids, right? Like. If something were to happen to my wife and I got remarried, I, you know, God forbid, but kind of a thing. But the, with my kids, if, if, if the new woman was trying to do things differently than how I wanted it, um, like when it comes, when push comes to shove, those are my kids, right? And I don't want them treated like that. And that, that, that can cause a lot of stress issues. Um, so yeah, with this, Young stepchildren often or can get hurt. They might have higher chances of getting sick because of the stress levels. Um, they can get lost, literally and or figuratively. They can kind of get lost in the background as, as the parents are trying to kind of figure out where they fit. Um, they can have disruptive behaviors and things that might show, which could be signs of stress in their lives. Um, with teenage stepchildren, you have a much higher chance of, of um, so if, if they get together, right, mom, and mom or step parent and step parent get together while you are a teen, you have a higher chance of, of teen pregnancy, um, teen drunkenness, and actually a higher chance of getting arrested statistically. Okay, not a guarantee, right? You're not like oh, I'm a stepchild, therefore I'm getting drunk. Um, but this, the, the odds are higher of those kinds of behaviors. Um, it it takes courage 
and it takes a very good person to overcome the potential issues of step parenthood. If you do it well, it can be amazing, but expect there to be some, some things that you're going to have to overcome. It's going to take patience. Um, you're going to need to be, you know, you're going to need to listen to the needs of those around you. Um, and, and this is really like this idea of generativity that occurs with, within Erickson, right? Um, it, it's at its peak if you are choosing to, to take on the role of a step parent. If you can do it, amazing, right? Um, but it's a, it can be tough. So people need that though. Like if we we need we need good people in our lives, and so that can be a really that can be a real good thing for kids um, if you're filling that that gap. Um, 31, parenthood, part five, foster parents. This is the most difficult form of parenting, partly because of the emotional and behavioral needs of children. Typically, if you're in a foster care system, you, you have not had an easy life, right? There's been some rough background type stuff. Um, <clears throat> it requires very intense involvement, okay, um, with the kids, right? Again, especially if they have special, like, emotional needs or, or, or psychological needs and things like that. Um, toughest part with this one is that you, it's not permanent. So you might have the kid for, for years, possibly. You might have the kid for months. You might have the kid for just a you know, couple weeks or something like that. Um, and with that, it, it, can, it can cause disruptions, essentially, um, in the attachment. And it, it'll, it'll reduce the likelihood of the child being able to attach to you well. Or if the child does attach to you, it basically can cause a break in there, you know, like all of a sudden they're like, they've attached to you and then they're ripped from you, which can be very devastating. Um, child movement makes generative attachment difficult, right? They're less likely to want to connect because of the fact that they don't know if they're gonna be with you forever. Um, grandparents, grandparenting provides new opportunities for generativity. Most grandparents enjoy their role and some are part of a skip generation family. And so we're, we're We'll keep going. We'll get, we'll explore some of that a little bit in a, in a minute. We'll actually explore that more in depth um, when we look at the the later adulthood, like kind of the, the idea of grandparentshood and things like that. Um, caregiving, sandwich generation, generation of middle aged people who are supposedly squeezed by the needs of younger and older members of their families. Right? Got grand? Maybe your parents are are needing special care because they're starting to decline. While at the same time, you got kids you know, either earlier adolescents or something like that, that are needing additional care also. Um, far from being squeezed, middle-aged adults who provide some financial and emotional help to their adult children are less likely to be depressed than those adults whose children no longer relate to them. So even if it seems like they're, it's a little, you know, maybe they're taking a little bit of advantage of you, if it isn't in fact a healthy relation, if it is a healthy relationship, um, the, the benefits far outweigh the little bit of being taken advantage of. Right. Um, we like to remain connected with our children, our offspring, if we can. 33, employment, part one. Other major avenue for generativity is employment, right? Kids is one, employment is the other. Adults have many psychosocial needs that employment can fulfill. In fact, they have found that, that unemployment is actually one of the leading causes of depression, anxiety, and is a, a, a big indicator of likelihood of uh, substance abuse, and uh, harmful behaviors to oneself, including suicide. Um, so unemployment is just, yeah, higher rates of child abuse, alcoholism, depression, and many other social problems. Um, it is, it's one of the biggest things that actually is gonna make you feel sad and kind of like you, you, you are gonna be down um, even on good days, unemployment. Even people who who think that it's a good thing, right? Like they're like, I'm gonna, I'm fine, I'm, I'm on my own, I got my freedom. Um, th their their rates of happiness are slightly lower than people who are happily uh, working. Happily working is the key, though, right? You, you could be miserable in a job, and that's not good either. Um, but if you if you find a job that is fulfilling, that's kind of the ideal for most people. Thirty four employment part two, uh, work meets generativity needs by allowing people to complete many tasks. <clears throat> Uh, develop and use their personal skills. So again, you're looking for a job that actually needs the things that you're good at, that you've been working on since childhood, right? Um, it allows you to express your creative energy if you have a good job. Uh, aid and advise coworkers as a mentor or a friend. Support the education and health of their families. 
uh, and they contribute to the community by providing goods or services, right? Um, so that, this really is something worth taking into account. Like these, these things, when you're exploring possible jobs, look at these things, especially this first couple, right? Are, are you going to be able to really develop and work on your skills that you have been working on? Um, is it going to be allow you to engage creatively? Uh, I've been in some jobs that did not, and it was miserable, right? You, you need that ability to really be who you are. So understanding that and then making that part of your identity can be a big helpful aspect. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Random fact number three before we move into slide 35. Um, pepperoni is actually an American cured meat. The first use of the word was actually in 1919, the first documented use of the word pepperoni. Um, so everyone thinks it's Italian, but it's actually American. Uh, so if you go to Italy, you're likely not going to find a pepperoni pizza, I discovered when I was over there. Um, or it's going to take some effort to find one. And it doesn't taste anything like an American pepperoni pizza, so don't get your hopes up. Um, pizza in Italy is, not, is, is a very different thing than pizza in America. So there you go. All right, slide 35, employment part three, extrinsic rewards of work. So tangible benefits usually in the form of compensation, right? A paycheck, that's going to be the compensation, uh, tend to be more important when people are young. One of the driving factors if you're in your early adulthood stages is going to be that paycheck, right? People ask you, like, why do you get the job? You're like, I need, a, I need to get paid. I want to get rich. We, 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 generally, younger people are more likely to associate success with wealth. Um, the older you get, it becomes a little bit less important. The extrinsic motivators become less the key thing, and intrinsic motivators become right. Extrinsic, external, exterior, uh, extrovert, right? That's going to be that extrinsic reward. Intrinsic, introvert, interior, okay, it's that in, inside. Um, intrinsic rewards of work are going to be those intangible gratifications. When, you do the, when you're doing your job well and you just get pleasure from doing it, right? Older workers are more likely to experience autonomy, mentor, and then with that, they can mentor younger workers and kind of figure out where they belong. And with that, that's going to be part of that intrinsic motivation. We, we get joy in helping other people kind of find their path. <clears throat> Absolute income matters more in relation to comparison with others in same profession, neighborhood, or previous salary. Here's an example. So I went, back, I went, I went to school back east um, and for one of my graduate degrees. Uh, so I was in, 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 in Indiana, in northern, in, or in, I, my school was in southern Indiana, but at the time I was in northern Indiana at a coffee shop, um, studying for, a, and writing a paper, and that, that doesn't matter really, but, um, I overheard a couple guys talking, <clears throat> um, and one of them was talking about how he was really struggling, okay, he was like, man, me and my wife are really struggling financially, I might have to sell one of my houses, okay. Psychology person, right? My, 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 I, I'm going to, without shame, I eavesdropped on their conversation. That caught my attention. I was like, you might have to sell one of your houses, right? Overhearing their conversation continuing as I'm like pretending to be writing my paper and re drinking my coffee. Um, it turns out this guy, like him and his wife, make over half a million dollars a year. They have multiple houses, um, but he's really financially struggling in his mind. Because the neighborhood he lives in, the average income is well over a million dollars a year. He gets up, goes out, and gets in his brand new BMW and drives off, right? And here I am, I'm like, so in his mind, he's poor. Okay. Here I am, a struggling college student, right? I literally, I literally like dug through pockets and things to find change enough to buy a cup of coffee. Um, but that, that absolute income. If you if you are comparing yourself to other people and your success to them, it's a much different thing, right? Um, so if you're if 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 other people in your area are making more than you, you feel poor. If ever so, and so you could be making fifty thousand dollars a year, you could be making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, but if you compare yourself to other people who are in the same area, if you're above what they are, okay. Let's say like I make a hundred thousand dollars a year and I live in an area where everyone makes fifty thousand dollars a year, I am wealthy, okay. Um, if everyone else who does the job that I'm doing that I'm aware of makes a little bit less than me, I am doing really good. On the other hand, if everyone else is making more than me, I feel kind of crummy, right? We compare ourselves to the Joneses kind of a thing all the time. 
And so, and or if I'm like, let's say like I look up the thing, like what's the average income for blah, blah, blah. And I make less than the average income, I feel crummy. If I make more than it, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, and so it, it is it's it, it is very arbitrary. It kind of, it's going to shift, our perspective of it is going to shift depending upon those aspects of life, right? Thus, somebody in Pueblo can make $50,000 a year and live a much better life compared to somebody who lives in like Denver. Uh, because of the, the cost of living and things also is going to be factors into that. Okay, 36, <clears throat> unemployment. The effects, uh, more stress over long term than divorce or bereavement. We get over divorce and bereavement, like somebody dying, a loved one dying, more easily than we get over uh, not having a job for a long period. Um, destructive to mental and physical health. Oftentimes we, we, we fall into depression and anxiety. Uh, it could lead to to uh, inappropriate behaviors, right? You might you might start slacking off on things. Uh, increases likelihood of of substance abuse and things like that, right? Um, psychological needs are generally going to be unmet with that, which is a high rate of domestic and substance abuse, depression, and other mental health problems. Okay. So yeah. Uh, it's a tough one. And when I look at like COVID and things like this, where we've gone through this time where there's a lot of people who lost jobs, um, you know, that, that had a lot bigger negative effect on health and, and, and mental health in a lot of ways than, than a lot of other aspects of it. Plus child abuse went through the roof because you have all these people who were working and now aren't working. And so there's stress and there's anxiety and, you know, you got kids that are stuck home and that increases the stress and all of that. So it, it, it was a rough one. Um, 37, employment changing workers, diversity among workers. So change from primarily white male civilian workforce in military to greater diversity of workers in all areas. So you have um, 1980 versus 2016 in this little graph. Let me see. This graph should also be in the book. It is on page... I went further than I thought. Sorry. Oh, by the way. Um, there's some interesting little like side things. The view from science is really interesting. This one with the, the skip generation family, um, things like that. Take a look at those. The uh, visualizing development is also kind of an interesting little thing to take a moment with. It's colorful, catches your attention. Um, posing perspectives, we're accounting for diversity. Oh, there we are, page 488. Um, you're going to find this little graph. But it shows basically that there has been an increase in, in uh, ethnicity diversity, basically, within the uh, U.S. labor force since 1980 to 2016. Okay. Um, yeah. There you go. 38. Employment changing locations. Um, job change. So, uh, it can harm human development in an individual. So if you if you've been well established in a job and like you're you you've got your coworkers that you know and you 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 know there's a sense of kind of like Maslow's hierarchy you know you you've got that people have respect for who you are and what you do and what you're capable of and all those kinds of things and then you either lose the job or or have to change jobs for some reason um, it can it can it could be positive but it also could be quite negative. Um, there's a chance of it increasing stress. All of a sudden, you're out of your environment, especially if you've been there for a while. Um, in the previous job, you know, you're, you're having to learn new people. You're trying to figure out what kind of your place and things. So you go from being maybe a mentor in the in a position to needing a mentor, which can be very stressful. That, that change in, in basically feels like kind of stepping back in our progression in, through adulthood rather than moving forward. Um, Things like higher salaries, respect, and greater expertise with seniority. So if you change jobs, again, unintentionally, um, you might lose those things. You, you lose that seniority, which re removes the, the higher salary respect and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's less likelihood of rehire of older workers. So if you if you lost a job for some reason, and you're, but you're in your like 50s or 60s, um, it can be more difficult to get a new job. It's still possible, but it can be more challenging. We'll look at that when we look at, at the, the, the next chapters. Um, and the reduction of longstanding intimacy and generativity. If you have friends that are coworkers, right, but now you have to get a new position, um, you might still get together with them every now and then, but you're not going to have that day-to-day -day 
you know, connection that you had before. And with that, that you can have that loss. And in a lot of ways, a lot of times you're going to kind of fade away from each other over time. Um, and so that can reduce that overall flourishing of friendships and things like that as well. Okay, 39, employment changing schedules, alternate schedules. So standard nine to five schedule is increasingly unusual. Closest you'll usually find to it today is the eight to five, um, but even that is getting harder and harder to pin down. <clears throat> An average of one third of US workers have non-standard jobs, meaning that their, their hours are not gonna be that nine to five or eight to five. Um, non-standard shifts may cause stress for families and parents. If you're working a nighttime shift, for example, or a graveyard, um, that can be quite challenging. To, to kind of find that balance with the family, right? You're the only one that has a really weird sleep schedule and you're, you're, everyone else is trying to do their normal thing. It could be challenging. Uh, Part-time work and self-employment do not always offer means to balance life demands. Some people are like, I'm just gonna work for myself, right? It'll be easier. You, you think that until you're working 80 hours a week and you realize just how much work it is, right? And you're like, man, I, the, the, the balance sometimes for, for work life uh, is is much more challenging in a lot of ways if you are working for yourself compared to if you're working for someone else <clears throat> There's no like I'm done necessarily when you're working for yourself Okay 40 finding the balance does modern life allow adults to have it all? Uh, is the idea of having it all an illusion or a mistaken ideal? Are women held back by society or by their own stereotypes and does gender differences are gender differences as they should be um, which of these is most makes most sense? I'm going to leave that to you, so you guys can ponder that. Uh, and as well as this last fact, um, Walter Hunt, an American, invented the safety pin in 1849. Before 1849, they didn't have safety pins; all they had were straight pins. So you can just imagine, like diapers must have been something interesting back then. But anyway, um, yeah, there you go. Last fact: Walter Hunt. Invented the safety pin. Um, that's it. We're done. Uh, so yeah, make sure you do the quiz for this chapter. Uh, message me if you have any questions. Don't forget to do the quiz for the lecture and the chapter. There's two, right? Um, and then otherwise, I will see you all in the next video. In the next video, we're going to be looking at uh, the beginnings of. Well, it's the beginnings and ending of late adulthood. Um, so 65 plus. It's kind of a fun, it's it's an interesting time in life, to say the least. It has the potential for the greatest joy, but it also has the potential for some of the greatest sorrow. So we'll discuss all that uh, in the next video. Until then, have a wonderful day, night, or morning, whatever time you happen to be watching this. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye.